You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Listen, when I tell you that I really thought I was going to write this episode in a few hours, I was deeply, sorely, and woefully mistaken. (laughs) I had really only ever seen cursory information about female samurai, which God knows we're about to get into why that's a misnomer and we should not generalize about that. So I thought this was going to be an incredibly straightforward episode. My friends, my friends, pithy listeners... Not, not... Not the case. The case. So, today, we are taking a very, very surface-level look at not one, not two, but three women over the course of a millennium. Millennium. A millennium. Mm Mm-hmm. That broke traditions, glass ceilings, and the skulls of her enemies. Okay, I like it. So let's just start by clarifying, and this is per my husband's distinct request. Oh, Lord. That samurai is a class and a profession. Just because you were part of the samurai class did not mean you were a samurai warrior. So no sword for the class. I mean, uh, yes and no. Oh, Jesus. All right. Yeah, definitely not a samurai. (laughs) That's fair. Pacifist all the way. All right, go on. The easiest way to explain the difference is that female samurai and samurai women are two different things. Got it. Female samurai warriors only got a sword if they were beshikime. And those are the ones who guarded samurai women who were the wives, daughters, concubines, etc. Okay, so the women were people that belonged to within a family of samurai. Mm-hmm. Beshikeme were the women chosen to protect them with a sword. Right. So was this like a sought after position? Did everyone want to become a Beshikeme? Because I don't. I don't know that everyone did, but it was a sought after profession. It was a job. Oh. They were extremely well respected and in turn well compensated. Ooh. Because the demand was so high, women had to go into the position with a very high level of martial art proficiency. This meant self-defense training, but also sword play skills. And the majority of the samurai women were educated in these self-defense techniques, but weren't required to be a professional by any means. Makes sense that if your dad and brothers are constantly playing around with swords, you might pick one up once in a while. Or, you know, at war. That also. Playing around with swords. I said that. Yeah. (laughs) Was that different? (laughs) So, the worst military spouse ever. (laughs) Just kidding. Okay, go on. Continue. You had to dedicate your life to training in order to become a Beshikime. That makes sense. These women had a job. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by the well-compensated statement. I'd like to know what kind of compensation they were getting. But were they still a wife and a mother as well? Could they be more than just Beshikime? Well, since it's covering a millennia, I think that that definition changed a lot. And we'll see with Mm. one of our, um, our Onimusha in a minute how those lines are blurred. But I think because we are covering such a vast span of time, there's not a singular answer to that. Okay. Those are the things that I pretty much understand about those. Those are pretty clearly the tenets. And I would like to say that that's kind of the end of it, but it's not. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> yeah. So we okay. need to note that the Onabukesha are different from Onimusha, who actually trained for offensive battle situations. I'm having trouble figuring out all these terms. Same. Fair. Same. (laughs) For lack of a better terminology, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize for the sports analogy, but here it is. So the Onabugesha, or the Beshikimi, were the defensive line, and the Onamusha was the offensive line. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. You would not believe how long it took me to flesh that out in my mind. (laughs) Were they in the gym every day, like lifting weights like the footballers, or did they have some other type of training? In addition to being skilled in literary arts and poetry and art, they had a lot of weapons training. The traditional weapon of choice was 
like really badass, okay? It's called the Naginata. And the closest Western equivalent is like a glaive or a halbert. And for those of us who aren't knowledgeable in weapon craft cough, <clears throat> me, cough, it's a spear, but the pointy end is a curved blade. If you've still not got a visual, you can check out our show notes and I will definitely have that there. <laughs> Google it for me right quick to tell me how it looked. <laughs> Oh, I can do that. Naginata. Okay. I would say it looks a bit like a scythe because it does have that slight curve. Mm-hmm. But it's on a whole long spear, not just like the yeah. short one. It's a long spear. I do not want to come into contact with this. Mm-mm. You can buy them. That's unfortunate. Oh, here's one that has some jagged edges. That that would really... Yeah. Basically, it looks like if it touched you, it would hurt oh so flippin' much. It's not exactly, though, what comes to mind when you think, like, samurai, right? No. It's not the sword. Yeah. It's a much shorter blade. And these were considered training weapons and were fit for a woman because of the weight and balance and the length. This enabled them to injure or kill at a distance. Okay, but I'm assuming that they had to have something else in case the opponent got closer. Yes, ma'am. You are so right. Excellent. They were skilled with the kaiken dagger while being well-versed in the art of just general knife fighting known as tanto jutsu. My biggest fear. Many of these weapons were designed for women who specialized in, like we said, distance fighting and could stay nimble when facing a physically stronger opponent. Mm -hmm. They were also skilled archers, martial artists who carried many concealed blades on their person at all times. And the reason why they kept so many knives on them was to help themselves and the women they perhaps were protecting to commit seppuku. Seppuku, the ritual suicide when all is lost, correct? Right. The men, I know, took a sword, one of their big ones that evidently the women aren't getting, and went directly into their stomach and then jerked upward. Which, again, The women didn't do that, though, because they didn't get a big sword. So what did they do? They didn't use a big sword, but they did use a sword, and they did disembowel themselves in the same way. Oh, so seppuku could be done by a female samurai class member, but it was her throat. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you were a warrior, you committed seppuku like like the men. But if you were a warrior, they would do it the men's way or the warrior way. I like that. Right. I mean, I don't like it. Don't do this. Don't try this at home, folks. But, okay, I see your point. So I'm getting the feeling that this episode is going to have a lot of our favorite thing, sides. Yes, a lot of one side. Think all french fries hold the salad, nothing else. I like the pun, Erica. Proud of you. Yeah, you're a bad influence. No, I'm not. (gasps) Okay, so we're talking suicide, I'm assuming. Yes, for most of the episode. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of just outright murder, but not a specific side. They fought a ton of battles. They're going to lose one, and that equals suicide. So here they go. Maybe, but not necessarily, but maybe. All right, go. You're going to get so much info. Start. I want to hear about Empress Jingu. Empress Jingu. Great name. Great name, but like all of our women, it's a circa. A circa baby. Born 170 CE and died maybe 269, which seems pretty old. Pretty old. That's 99 years. Yeah. That feels optimistic yeah. for a warrior samurai female. And empress. In that time period. And empress. This comes from Britannica, my favorite source. She is the semi-legendary empress regent of Japan who is said to have established the Japanese hegemony over Korea. Okay. According to traditional records of ancient Japan, Jingu was the wife of Chuai, which is not like a Chuhai, but sounds deceptively similar. Stop. And he was... Hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chuhai, for those of you who don't know, is the best mixed drink in the entire world. Yes. You will drink three and you'll say, isn't this just fruit juice and soda? But no. Yep. You will be hammered. Yes, so delicious. It's delicious. Continue. He was the 14th sovereign and reigned until about 192 to 200. And she became the regent for her son, Ojin. Now this is kind of where the timeline falls apart. Yeah. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Aided by a pair of divine jewels, oh, no. which some folks classify as one of the treasures of the royal imperial household. That's a whole other episode, though. That allowed her to control the tides. And she's said to have begun her bloodless, <clears throat> bloodless, <clears throat> conquest of Korea. That's impressive. Yeah, in the year 200, when her husband died, and according to legend, her unborn son, Ojin, later was deified as Hachiman, the god of war, remained in her womb for three years, giving oh. her time to complete the conquest and return to Japan. So you can see how this is legendary. Whoa, 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 I'm sorry. So, yeah. yes, there's a lot of issues here. I'm, I'm not even going to get into the divine jewels. Yep. But bloodless conquest, I feel that pretty much any Korean person would argue otherwise. Mm-hmm. So the year her husband died, she was like, cool, let's go take over Korea. And also, unborn son that everybody knows is already there because now I'm regent rather than just being overthrown. Can you please hang on for an extra 24, 27 months mm -hmm. and just give me time to finish? Uh, what? Yeah, this small trip of establishing a hegemony. Her story obviously is highly contested. And... There is a premise for her being an empress called Himike, which is, she's much more well documented, let's put it that way. Because Jingu does not show up in the Chinese or Korean chronicles, but does in the Japanese. Okay. There is, however, evidence for her actually being real. I mean, maybe it was this Himike woman, not Jingu especially. But we all know from our Wu Zetian episode, naming things <laughs> are kind of different. Yes. Name changed based on the job or the title of time. Right. It could be that there is evidence for her being a real person named Timmy K. And she is referred to as the Queen of Wa, which is what they called Japan before it was Nihon. Okay. She took over Korea, so she's famous for this. And then was she supposed to be the regent for the next 69 years or basically yeah basically basically yeah even if this isn't a real person because i think there is definitely a possible semi-legendary as you say king arthur like legend i do love that it's still a female yes that the japanese culture would mm -hmm. have allowed for a female to be so heroically presented and to have right. the credit of taking the conquest of a foreign nation Mm -hmm. I don't think many Europeans would do that at the time. No, no. And this is before Confucianism really had a foothold. That's a good point. And as we learned in previous episodes, Confucianism is where a lot of those ideas about women being subservient yeah, yeah, exactly. came from. This makes me think of Bodicea a lot. Yeah, it's really interesting to note that the reason she goes on this conquest to Korea is to appease the gods, because apparently her husband, Chuai, got a directive from the gods that Korea needs to be taken over. And he just was a little lackadaisical about it, and so when he died, <laughs> the legend goes that she took that as divine punishment, and you need to go do it. I think that's another interesting little tidbit. A quest. Yes, a quest. I absolutely agree. I really, I like this. Okay. So. Was she real? Was she not? Who's to know? Who is to know? Except maybe Chuai or Chuhai. Yeah. He probably knew. He probably knew, but probably had too much Sochu in his Chuhai to actually. Yeah. I'm sorry. I like that. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So next is our Onimusha part two, which is my favorite, Tomoe Gozen. Tomoe Gozen. An absolutely no surprise turn of events, we have almost zero information about her birth, youth, or upbringing. There's gotta be a circa. Nope, not even a circa. A century? It, yeah, century. <laughs> we'll find the century, folks, because, you know, we want to put you somewhere in the timeline. The late 12th century. All right. Is that the Warring States period? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yes, Genpei Wars. Genpei Wars. Yep. Done. From what we know about Onimusha, we can assume but not confirm that her family were of the samurai class, so noble and not peasants, and she was provided with an education in self-defense and probably literary arts and regular arts and maybe some STEM, but maybe not. And that's about it. Okay, so... Why are we talking about her if we don't know anything about her? 
<laughs> well, that's just her youth. Oh, okay, just her youth. Okay, so was she talented? Was she an introvert? What do we know? Nothing. Nothing concrete, but we do get a physical description. Okay, which is actually pretty rare. We never get that. It is, and this is from the tale of Heike. She was described as, quote, especially beautiful with white skin, long hair, and charming features. She was also a remarkably strong archer and a swordswoman. She was a warrior worth a thousand, ready to confront a demon or a god, mounted or on foot. She handled unbroken horses with superb skill. She rode unscathed down perilous descents. Whenever a battle was imminent, Yoshinaka sent her out as his first captain, equipped with strong armor, an oversized sword, and a mighty bow and she performed more deeds of valor than any of his other warriors." Unquote. <laughs> well, that's a remarkable statement about a remarkable woman. I would like to be described as like a quarter of that. I want someone to say that I was ready to meet God or devil in battle, but I also don't really want to do <laughs> battle, but you know. So picture it. I, this is some high stakes. I'm picturing it. The Imperial family has been rendered powerless, and a bunch of cousins are fighting over control of the country. These folks had risen to power as daimyo, which are like land owners and lords, and they'd won these lands because of their work as, you guessed it, samurai warriors. Warriors. Yep. Yep. Tomoe and her family served Minamoto Yoshinaka. She, of course, was an Onamusha, which the literal translation is female warrior. And as we just heard, she was downright legendary on the battlefield. Okay. So now we are at the Battle of Awazu. And this was not Yoshinaka's day. Not at all. By the end of said battle, he was down to five warriors, one of which being Tomoe. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to be on a field of battle with only five warriors. No. It's N not no. a good, good idea. It was clear they were defeated and would die here and now. He entreated her to run, citing it would be dishonorable to die with a woman. Um, wait a minute. It's fine for her to be trained in battle. It's fine for her to be an Onamusha. It's fine for her to go into battle. It's fine for her to commit seppuku with their, you know, honorary knife cutting and knife. But it's not cool for him to die with her. That feels... It doesn't make sense. I don't understand how that thinking... Right. Sounds like it was a literary device to give her an out. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure whether or not that quote was meant to be realistic, like he really felt that way, or if he white fanged her. Do you know what I mean by that? No. The movie White Fang. What is the movie White Fang? I don't know. It's about this... I, I don't know. I, I've never actually seen it, but the term is basically <laughs> he throws rocks at his pet wolf to save his life, but the only way the wolf is going to leave is if he's mean to him. Oh. And so if you're mean to someone, but for the, the greater good or for their well-being, you've white fanged He someone. wanted to save her, but he hurt her feelings so that hopefully she would leave because she felt abandoned. Alleged. Or insulted. We don't know. Is it really an insult or did he white fang her? Who knows? Because Lady Tomoe was a servant lover and in some reports a wife of Minamoto Kiso Yoshinaka, the guy we're talking about. Okay. So it makes more sense if it was his wife and he didn't right. want her to die with him or worse, see him die. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. We also get this okay. really interesting thing that even if they were not lovers or married, they were very close growing up because they shared a wet nurse. Huh. That, yeah. I find that to be the strangest thing in history. Like, oh my God, we're besties. We had the same wet nurse. It's super common. But, but it's it's super common. It's who you would have spent the time with, right? Like you're growing up together. I mean, how long were they breastfeeding? You know, it never The happened. Minoto, or the wet nurse, and her family played an essential role in bringing up and educating the child or children entrusted to them. They identified their interests completely with the child's. Okay. That sounds... Dedicated. Yeah, dedicated. And apparently it was only a position nobles had. Okay. Which is very, very different westernized wet nurses. Yes, very much so. So this was a noble wet nurse. 
Yes, because only the noble breast milk would do. I suppose. Personally, I am fine with Similac. <laughs> when you can find it. When you can find Moving it. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on, because that seems way more insurmountable than the uh, Genpei Wars. I just want to put this out there. Fed is best. Whatever works for you, yes. whip it out or measure it yep. out. It doesn't matter where it comes from as long as baby is happy and healthy. Oh, my God. You know you want to use that. Why are you not in Good marketing making these freaking slogans? <laughs> Anyway, so because they were... Whip it out, whip it out. (laughs) Whip it out when he's hungry. Please let me get back to the Genpei Wars. (laughs) (laughs) This was truly very War of the Roses in the sense that it was a family affair. Yoshinaka and Tomoe were were very much in the same camp and were engaged in this political competition with his cousin, which theoretically would have been another one of their household members, and his name is Yorimoto. And he would later establish the Kamakura Shogunate, no spoilers. <laughs> Tomoe accompanied Yoshinaka on his military campaigns and served him loyally on the battlefield. And significantly, she was entrusted with the authority as his Ippo no Taisho, or leading commander. So she led his troops into battle. Whoa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. The Haika that we mentioned earlier describes her alleged last fight on the Battle of Awazu, which I don't like the word alleged because I think, she, I, I want to believe it actually happened this way. Okay. But after the mortally wounded Yoshinaka orders her departure, you know, white fanged her, you know, who knows, whatever, whatever, orders her departure to send news of his imminent death to his family. This is what allegedly went down. Okay. From this great source for this episode, Rochelle no Milwaukee, women warriors of early Japan, quote, Tomoe made no move to go, but Yoshinaka insisted until at last she said, at least I would like a worthy opponent. I would like to show you my Lord Kiso, which was his middle name, my last combat in your service. So she lay in wait for an enemy, and there appeared one famous for his strength throughout the province of Musashi, Odna no Hachiro Morishiga, with 30 horsemen, 30 three zero. Tomoe charged in among them, went straight to Onda no Hachiro, fiercely seized him and pinned his head on the pummel of her saddle, then wrenched it around, cut it off, and tossed it away. After that, she removed her armor and escaped towards the east. What happened to the 30 men? Were they not going to protect this dude? They were like, oh, well, she took his head off, so bye? What? I guess that's why the allegedly is in there. I have questions. If but you, as a foot soldier, just see... The legendary aspect comes She literally play. yanked his head off, broke his neck, and then severed his head. I would run the other way. You know what? I don't need to die for this. He's dead. Like, I'm I'm good. I'm good. I know that's what we would do, but I also know that that's really not the stance that most of these warriors would have taken. How it is not in uh, Bushido. It's not the code of Bushido. So. It's not the code of Bushido. I guess my question really is, why did they give her the time to take off all her armor and just leave? <laughs> I don't know. I like the imagery. I mean, I don't, and I'm sure he didn't, Mr. Beheaded. And so she left. Yoshinaka then was killed real good and dead. There's not like a super clear manner of death. I'm not going to miss him. Yeah, but poor Tomoe probably missed him. I'm sure. But okay. since he's not important, can I assume that she is? And do we know what happens to her? Taking again from the history of women warriors. Similarly, there remains such speculation about Lady Tomoe's departure from the battlefield. Author Stephen Turnbull states that the Wada Yoshimori attacked her using a pine trunk as a club and then made her his concubine. Oh. Yeah. There are similar reports that say Yoshimori took her as his wife in hopes of producing a strong warrior son gifted with skills that would prove favorable for Yorimoto, the cousin who ended up establishing the shogunate. I could see that. Cheka Mulhern proffered that Yoshimori believed, quote, so valiant a woman would surely bear him valiant sons, 
folklorish hero Asahina Yoshide, famed for his colossal strength, was described in legends as Tomoe's son with Yoshimori, the actual shogun. Okay. And varied accounts say that despite her gender, Tomoe was destined for beheading by Yorimoto for her role as an enemy commander. Other sources say that Tomoe escaped imprisonment, went into hiding, and eventually came a nun who died at age 99. Whatever the case may be of her eventual fate, Tomoe goes in and her reputation as the ideal Onomusha endured. She's beautiful, she's loyal, yes. and she's skilled. Mm -hmm. I like her story. I like that it at least has some facts. Yes. Because the last one felt pretty wishy-washy to me. Yeah, she's semi-legendary. I just, I keep going back to King Arthur. This feels very King Arthur to me. Legend of the Round Table. I think most people know who Lancelot was. Mm -hmm. These royal knights. And I know that a knight and a samurai is not an exact comparison, but I think it's a pretty close understanding of an idealized version. It could be that this one woman was made up of many women that kind of all came together to fit into her. Oh, Jingo definitely, but not Tomoe Gozen. She is for real. Her own person. And while we try to make these connections through a Western lens to understand it better, there's just, like you said, not an equivalent. No, it's a very different system than we're accustomed to. All right, you said there was one more? Mm-hmm. One more. Lay it on me. This is Nakano Takeko. And to give you a quick little snippet about her, the subtext under her photo, her hair tied back, trousers, and steely eyes, she radiated an intense male spirit and engaged the enemy troops, killing five or six with her naginata. And I'm looking at the picture, and I'm not going to go with male spirit because, you know. But I am going to say she does look intense, and I would not want to cross that woman. I would not disobey this woman. I would not. Don't test me. I want to, again, shout out one of the best sources that I used for this. It's Badass of the Week. And oh my gosh. Yes. It uh, yes. hit the nail on the head for this one. It, it gave a lot of Badass of the Week. Really good it. standard information, but also really did a nice job of synthesizing it. So thank you, Badass of the Week. <clears throat> Let's get started. We actually know some stuff about her. Ooh. Nakano Takeko was born in Edo, which is present-day Tokyo, which is kind of near where we live, in 1847. Her family was from Aizu, and that's a town on the western edge of Fukushima Prefecture, so you probably heard about Fukushima because of the reactor explosion. Why she was born in Edo and then made her way to Fukushima, which is a pretty far... It's not next door, no. It's not next door! And the trains weren't really a thing then, because that came after Meiji Restoration. Yeah. You would have been on foot, pretty much, or horses. On foot or by a cart. Yeah. Oh, but wheels were outlawed. What? The wheel was outlawed in Japan up until after the Meiji Reformation. I did not know that. The wheel was outlawed. Well, that will come into play in a minute, surprisingly. She was adopted at a young age by a master swordsman named Akoka Daisuke and began her martial arts training in Edo, so Tokyo, at the age of just six years old. I'm gonna go ahead and hedge your questions off. I don't really know why she was adopted because her parents and her family they were living. She does eventually go back to Aizu. Maybe it's an informal adoption, like what we talked about in our Tea Time in Rabbit Holes on Patreon. We talked about how in Hawaii, it was very common for another family member to adopt a baby and raise them so that you weren't raised by your parents, but you were raised within your own familial community. So it could be that. Tis a guess. Well, she was really gifted as a swordswoman. So I can't imagine that she put that out there at six years old, but maybe. Who knows? Now, as per usual, we don't know a ton about her upbringing, <laughs> other than the fact that she was traditionally trained in the martial arts, and she had a sister named Yuko. Okay. And that's, that's that. That's it. Yeah, that's that. Done. <laughs> Where things pick back up for her is when she turns 21, she's left her adopted father because he started to be like, hey, you know what you should do? Get married to my nephew. Ew. <laughs> Mm, yeah, no, I don't think so. No, thank you. This is not the road that I'm going to travel. So she's 21. Meiji Restoration is kicking off. It's about three years after the Civil War. And to way, I mean way oversimplified, the Civil War going on in Japan was where two factions were very much at odds to the 
future of Japan. Like, what should Japan be going forward? One wanted to modernize and westernize and make the imperial family back in charge rather than the shoguns. And the others were really happy to stay in this feudal power, stay under the shogunate, stay as things had been for a really long time. Still not have access to the wheel. Yeah, no wheels. That's a problem. The Britannica says, You know I love the Britannica. The Meiji Restoration in Japanese history is the political revolution in 1868 that brought about the final demise of the Tokugawa shogunate, or a military government system. And that ended the Edo, or Tokugawa, period that lasted from 1603 until 1867. It was during this time that they tried to get rid of all westernization, and so anything that had been invented in the West, like the wheel, was out. They wanted to at least nominally return control of the country to the direct imperial rule under Mutsuhito, who would become the Emperor Meiji. In a wider context, however, the Meiji Restoration of 1868 came to be identified with the subsequent era of major political, economic, and social change called the Meiji Period, which took over right after from 1868 until 1912. And that brought about the modernization and westernization of the country. It's when Japan opened up to the rest of the world and it began to really take in lots of new ideas really quickly. The restoration event itself insisted of a coup d'etat in the ancient imperial capital of Kyoto on January 3rd, 1868. The perpetrators announced the ouster of Tokugawa Yoshinobu, or the last shogun, who by late 1867 was really effectively no longer in power. And they proclaimed the young Meiji emperor to now be the ruler of Japan. Yoshinobu mounted a very brief civil war that ended with his surrender to the imperial forces in June of 1869. And Yoshinobu is... The shogunate. Yoshinobu Tokugawa. Oh, got it. Back to the story. Nakano goes back home to Aizu, because she's like, dude, I'm not marrying your nephew, where this rebellion and civil war is. And so she sided with the shogunate. And even after the Meiji forces overthrew the shogun, seized control of the country, and put forth this new plan to modernize Japan, the warriors and samurai of Nakano's hometown refused to submit. I think a lot of the samurai were very concerned about what a modernization would do to their prestige and their class in general. Of course. They're out of power. Mm -hmm. The warriors and samurai of Nakano's hometown refused to submit, and their resistance soon became open conflict. And in October of 1868, the war finally came to Aizu. And somewhere around 30,000 imperial soldiers, many of them now equipped with guns, forced the surrender of the castle and submission of its lords. Knives against guns. Yeah. I feel that we've seen this play out before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Despite almost hopeless odds, the castle at Aizu somehow withstood the full might of the Meiji forces' assault for many days. Ah! No clear answer on the many days, how many, but I would say many is more than five. Okay. Because, you know, a couple is two, a few is three, some is four. We're so gonna go with five or more. Five or more, yeah. It's a chronicler guesstimate. TM, trademark. <laughs> A CG. <laughs> As 5,000 heroic defenders fired arrows and arquebuses from the walls. I have no idea what that is. They're guns. Okay, The sure. gun that has the flouted end. Ooh. So they fired those from the walls. Yeah, desperately trying to defend their homeland against an army that outnumbered them five to one. <laughs> Nakano Takeko hurried through the halls and courtyards, organizing and commanding a unit of somewhere between 20 and 30 women from the castle called the Joshitai, the army of women, including her mother and 17-year-old sister. And these women had all been trained by Nakano in hand-to-hand -hand combat and basic military commands and they stood ready to sortie out and defend the castle to their last breath. That sounds like the worst. The worst. Possible. Yeah, I don't want to do that. In. This is very Game of Thrones. But they did get their you know, chance. She makes me think of Arya. Yeah. So they did eventually get their chance to defend the castle. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. woohoo. October 10th. I don't want my chance. Don't give me the chance. But October 10th, 1868. 
The enemy broke through one of the outer defenses and began to threaten the small artillery unit attached to the Aizu defenders. But before the battle, I don't know how she had this amazing forethought. She, to be fair, it's not like things were looking good for the last five days. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> she had written her death poem in the traditional calligraphy style and made a suicide pact with her sister that neither of them should be taken alive by the enemy. You know, I love the notion of a death poem. I'm not sure that in my darkest hour I would take the time. That's just not, I would probably just be pissed and scared. And it's very Japanese. It's just so beautifully, I don't want to say poetic, obviously, but it's very artistic. Yeah, but do you really want to leave that to somebody else? What if they screw it up? That's just me. But I'm a control freak till the end. I think it's the process of writing it more than it is keeping it. Does that make sense? It's for her. It's not for the reader. My thought. Maybe not. I don't know. I guess that's true. I look at it from a more pragmatic situation. Like, who better to tell my story or say anything about my death than me? Fair enough. But that's just because I am who I am as a person. You're managing expectations. Control freak. Yes. Managing expectations. So we're in the battle. Yes. Suicide pact is done. Death poem written. What happens, Erica? So now we are, of course, like you said, in the midst of battle and the Joshitai are meeting the men head on to try to destabilize the lines and protect protect that artillery. And of course, we know who comes out in a blade and gunfight on top. It's not the knives. But Nakano alone was able to kill at least six of their soldiers and would have kept fighting were it not for one well-placed shot to the chest. Oh, I mean, okay. Yes and no. Six. There were 30,000. Six is great. Six to one. She did a good job. Didn't make a dent. I mean, yeah. If you know what I mean. Didn't make a dent. And also, one well-aimed shot, any shot, probably would have made this pretty hard to finish. That's true. That's true. In the flurry of battle, her sister found her, and Nakano made her swear to decapitate her so that the enemy would not be able to take her head as a trophy. And like any good sister, she did. (laughs) Yeah. I am really grateful I don't have a good sister right now. I don't have any sister. Yeah, right? (laughs) Would your sisters decapitate you upon request? I don't know that they would decapitate me, but they would definitely make sure the whole body wasn't found. That's fair. I think. Honestly, why wouldn't you just bury the whole body? Just quickly. Maybe it was faster to decapitate her. I don't know. It's a lot of sawing. Gotta get through all that bone. But maybe the knives were like made for that because they did have the naginatas. That's true. Well... Excellent work to her sister. Yuko. Way to go, Yuko. Yeah. Because I could not do that. I would be too squeamish. Get this now. Aizu Castle held out for several more days after Nakano's death and eventually surrendered on November the 6th, 1868. Almost a whole month. Yeah. And its fall effectively did mark the end of the samurai and the feudal system in Imperial Japan. Now, just a little tidbit, Nakano's sister managed to get away and buried her beloved sibling's head beneath a tree outside a quiet temple in Fukushima, which still stands today and allegedly still holds her Naginata from the battle. Oh, wow. Yeah, and in Fukushima, especially in Aizu, it is still very common and a very respected thing to honor the Onimusha and the Joshitai and study the Naginata. This reminds me of, again, I hate to do the comparison, but I think it's helpful for me and I, I hope it's helpful for our listeners. It makes me think of the the Alamo, the last stand. <gasps> like just this, <laughs> that's what it feels like. <laughs> It does. It's a really remember the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. Remember the what is the name of this of this battle? Remember the Onamusha. Izu Castle. Remember Izu Castle. This last stand. So I'm intrigued that people got away and that they did eventually surrender. It's not what I expected. I kind of expected literally them all to die. Yes. My heart says, oh, thank goodness. They had the sense there is no point in dying for this because we're going to lose no matter what. Well, um, I'm going to Debbie Downer myself. So just go ahead and prepare yourself. Okay, I'm ready. The women were taken prisoner to be kept alive, but not for any chivalric reason. Let's leave it at that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They did not want to be taken prisoner for a reason. And I'm totally down with that. But she got away. 
So she must have just escaped the prison situation? Yeah, yeah. There were survivors, and most of them were women because they were not going to be treated very nicely. But obviously there are survivors, and that's how the story gets told. Makes sense. Because I'm sure holding out against five to one odds for over a month and then having several really prominent people killed by women is not exactly how you want to go down. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's kind of embarrassing. I can see that. Interesting. This would have been after Confucianism really put that whole hold on the traditional home. So it would have been probably in that time actually a dishonor to be killed by a woman. Okay. Despite the fact that there were still active Onamusha. Yeah, that is... Um, Interestingly, we talked about some of them might have had children, right. might not have had children. But I'm not sure, based on these stories, if it was a profession that was all-encompassing, like you were this and nothing else. Or if you could manage to do more than one thing. And I, I don't know that we'll have an answer. Right. Considering Tomoe Gozen, it seems like that is especially hairy because she was purported to be his wife or his lover. Mm -hmm. So perhaps she did have children, but they just weren't mentioned. Or perhaps she was forced to have children with someone because she had good genes and they right. wanted to have her strength and her prowess. That's very different from a, a mother in the traditional sense. Bringing forth children in a loving, that's consensual way. A womb. I don't think it's clear. I also want to know about this compensation. <laughs> Let's see. The reason that it was well compensated or said so was because things that were found or documented just indicated that they were very well off as far as the combs that they wore. Well, and if you're not going to marry into a family and you're not going to have a husband to support you, you would need to have <laughs> that. You would need to have some security. Right. So that makes sense to me, just securing their future. Furthermore, they had to pay for weapons. That's not cheap. True, true. What I love about this episode is that you were able to find three different examples, and they were from pretty much a thousand years apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. But what did you come across as your overwhelming thought about the Onamusha? And did, it, did you learn something? Ooh. Because you live in Japan and you're around this culture more and we both have enjoyed studying it. Is there anything that you came across that you thought this is not what I expected? I did not know that there were such a plethora of women warriors. Yes, we did three, and most of that was for time, because there were about four others that really caught my eye. These were the most the most notorious or most well-known. Yeah. So I guess I didn't know that they were that common. I thought that it was very much a one-off situation, which from my research, I can tell that it was fairly commonplace. Mm -hmm. I agree. I thought it was a random daughter who was really gifted from the samurai class mm -hmm. would be allowed to do the studies. I didn't, yeah. I had no idea that we were looking at an option. Yeah. What's so interesting about, for instance, Nakano Takeko, we have actual pictures of her and they're not of her in her armor. They're of her in kimono. And same with the woodblock prints or the silk paintings of Tomoe Gozen. She's not in armor, she's in a kimono. Even when they say they have a masculine spirit or they were worth a thousand warriors, there's not a separation from femininity. You can be feminine and still kick butt. I don't have to give up one to be the other. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. And something I hadn't noticed within the stories, but now that you've said that, yeah. I do absolutely see that. They would have been expected to take off their work clothes at the end of the day and be their, their own person. That tells me at some level they were allowed. From my obviously armchair opinion, if they are being portrayed in this multifaceted way, there could have been a multifaceted aspect to their life. life. Or maybe it's not something you did for an entire lifetime. Maybe it's something you did. I wondered that as well. Yeah. Is it the young? And then you kind of grow out of that. And or even maybe not protected. grow out of that. But if you, if you do find someone you're interested in, or if you want to be a little more grim about it, if your family has other needs for you, mm. like an arranged that marriage. Yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's your grim. Debbie Downer moment. <laughs> it's history. It's full of Debbie Downers. But it's true. That is the truth up until very recently in history. Mm -hmm. Women and men were used by their families for marriage alliances. And even today, mm -hmm. we don't see it 
on a day-to-day -day basis in the same way, but I guarantee you it is still prominent in many cultures, for better or for worse. Humans in general have a proclivity to stay with what's comfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that's how you get people who are from same socioeconomic classes marrying each other, and it is still pretty much an anomaly to marry outside of that. I, I guess I don't want to, like, do this whole class warfare thing. No, I don't think we need to go there. On that lovely note. That lovely note. That, my friends, is that. Check out the show notes. I had amazing sources for this one, especially the women warriors. I really want to read the tale of Heike. Until next week, I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we are Pithily Yours. This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!